Greetings. Let's talk for a minute. So, I want to change course a little bit today, and I want to do something. Um, I want to do something different for you all. Let's go back a little bit to within my lifetime. The year is 1995. I'm in high school, and the closest theater was probably about. I guess I want to say five miles from my house and I didn't have a driver's license yet so if you want to go see a movie either my parents would drive me up there or if they were busy I would put on shoes and walk and I remember one Saturday I wanted to go see a movie just like I'm ready to go I think I was 16 at that point and I said uh, I want to go see a movie mom's like are you sure I can't drive you I'm like yeah I'm fine so I got out and I started hoofing it <clears throat> Um, I think about two hours later, I made it to the theater. Um, not that I was walking nonstop the whole two hours. I, I remember stopping, I think, at a gas station to grab a candy bar or something. In any event, I got to the theater and um, looked at what was playing. And uh, there was a new film out that was getting rave reviews, a uh, cast that was well regarded. And <clears throat> I figured what the hell let's go see it and of course uh, the movie was Braveheart now I know the moment I say that half of you are rolling your eyes especially the half of you who uh, were alive at that point um, or perhaps older than me and uh, were kind of aware in real time of how atrocious the history was in that film and the other half of you honestly probably uh, either enjoyed the movie for what it was or haven't seen it yet. And that's kind of what I want to talk about here. I want to talk about a movie that <clears throat> has some pretty horrible history. And I, I don't even think that the uh, creators of the movie want to claim that it is... Um, good history but at the same time that film helped that film did have a lot of very important effects on popular conversation about what we broadly will term the Middle Ages uh, for American audiences I think that was for the majority of us that was our first exposure to Edward I of England, Longshanks, who he was never called that in his lifetime. That was probably the first time most American audiences had heard the name William Wallace. Um, Robert the Bruce is probably slightly better known in popular culture at that point, but only slightly. <clears throat> How Where he fit into Scottish and English history uh, was certainly a question mark for the overwhelming majority of American audiences and based on a lot of interviews and based on a lot of articles that have been written since then um, a lot of British and Scottish Welsh and Irish audiences also really these names were for better or worse just bullet points on a history test that I had to pass some number of years ago so this movie, um, it, it brought these historical figures back into conversation. I remember talking about Braveheart with my friends. I remember talking about Braveheart with my parents. I remember dinner table conversations. And it, it brought this conversation up. It, it brought history back into current conversation. Now, of course, <laughs> it did it in a lot of respects all of the wrong ways um, you know I mean, where do you start uh, kilts were not a thing at the time of William Wallace um, the movie says outright you know that the English had occupied Scotland for um, I think it was 50 or 100 years and, and the history is that uh, England's invasion of Scotland took place under Edward the first he was the king who sought to expand the English Empire or the English uh, rule 
Um, and it had only happened, I believe it was a year, maybe two, before the first battle with William Wallace's forces. Um, at matter of fact, at uh, Sterling Bridge. Um, and Sterling Bridge, the first battle in the film is an open field battle. It's, you know, the cavalry charge and uh, the uh, mass of Scottish uh, peasants with um, only a handful of Scottish horsemen and and the English charge across with their heavy cavalry. Um, you know, these are, uh, these are images ingrained in the minds of people who saw it in the theaters originally. The reality of it is, is that the Battle of Stirling was a bridge battle. The, the Scots waited for half of the English army to cross the bridge and then attacked, blocking half of the army from coming back across the bridge and then slaughtering the other half as they tried to cross the bridge to unite with the rest of their forces, divide and conquer in the most classic sense. Um, and uh, you know, there's a joke that during filming in Scotland, a local uh, said to the director, uh, Mel Gibson, um, you know, I thought Sterling was a bridge battle. And Mel Gibson replied, it is, but the bridge kind of got in the way of, you know, the bridge kind of got in the way. And the guy replied back, yeah, that's what the English found too. Um, <clears throat> there, there's so much wrong with that film. We could, there, there are literally, uh, books written on how bad that film is historically. Um, as a matter of fact, I think one of the better quotes on that subject, and I, I do want to get the name right here, a reviewer and journalist, Elizabeth Evans said, this movie almost totally sacrifices historical accuracy for epic adventure. Um, and it is. It's an epic story. I mean, it, it's the literal building blocks of an epic story. It's it's kings and queens and princes and rebellions and battles and fights for kingdoms and you know it's it's uh, it's a phenomenal narrative. It's just so so much of it is fictional. So why are we talking about it for for a society that's a five hundred one c three not for profit educational institution like the SCA is. Why am I talking about Braveheart of all films? Well, <clears throat> there, there are a couple of reasons. And the first is I feel like we have to talk about films like Braveheart because if we don't, we are giving up a golden opportunity to properly discuss history. Now, that's not to say we need to run around telling everyone how bad a film it is. It's art. It actually, from an artistic standpoint, is a phenomenal film. It took, uh, as a matter of fact, this film took best director, best makeup, best cinematography, best sound effects, and best picture, excuse me, best picture Oscars. Um, that, that's not a sweep by any stretch of the imagination, but if you look at the number of films that take home that many Oscars at a time, it's a very short list. So this film, in, from an artistic standpoint, was a phenomenal story. But we as historians, when we dismiss it and we say, no, no, it, it wasn't accurate, so we don't want to talk about it, which I've heard people say, we really give up a golden opportunity to discuss real history. Um, because when people are talking about the Battle of Stirling Bridge, when people are talking about William Wallace, when people are talking about Robert the Bruce, or Longshanks, properly called Edward the First, and I remember at the time, you no, know, people were more or less uh, talking about the movie and regurgitating the talking points of the movie, which, from a historical standpoint, were very much Scottish propaganda, or would be considered Scottish propaganda. But today, there's a whole group of people out there who haven't seen the film, who we can use this film as a phenomenal tool to engage them, because it's a great film. I, I honestly, truly believe that. And we can 
we can talk to them and we can say, here's a really good film. And there are positive things to take away from Braveheart. There are. I'm, I'm not joking. And you, I think my, my older viewers, that is to say my age or older, will probably remember this and recognize this better than many of you who came of age more fully in the Internet era. Before Braveheart, at least in the circles I walked in, there was this equally fictitious belief that medieval combat wasn't quite as gory and bloody and brutal because the armies weren't that large. Everyone was in armor and usually got the tar beat out if you got an arm broken, got a concussion, but your armor protected you and you were ransomed. The The idea of wholesale slaughter, the idea of 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 fight to the death combat. I mean, today we understand that that's a timeless factor that was taking place, you know, with the earliest ages of man and into the modern day. But there was just this, and it, it truly was a product of Hollywood. It truly was a product of, of how movies were filmed and how battles were portrayed. Um, but the idea of battle being gruesome and visceral and bloody and nasty for some reason, there was just this this belief among so many people that the the armor of the Middle Ages it wasn't you know it wasn't that brutal and say what you will about the history, but Braveheart shattered that really stupid misconception outright as it should have. Um, another thing that that film that film did really well was it demonstrated, it showed people who today we would consider very simple. I mean, it, the, the fact of the matter is, is that, um, you know, you're talking about people who had, by today's metrics, only the most basic understanding of sciences, maths. Um, a lot of figures, you know, a lot of the, the supporting characters in the film would probably not have been literate. Many of the main characters, while they would have spoke multiple languages, the reality is is that the number of books they would have had access to would be very small. The libraries like we have today and, and of course online reading to collect information at a whim at our fingertips, you know, it, it, that's truly changed how we consume information. These are people who while they probably did read and speak multiple languages may have only read 10, 15, 20 books in their lives. They were busy with the affairs of state or leading or ruling or administering. And I, I feel like the movie does a very good job of conveying how truly sophisticated and adept they were in their environment. And again, I think some people in the, uh, you know, for many of you who are younger, there may be a bit of a, well, that sounds like a strange thing to say. And I'm willing to bet a number of you who perhaps are my age or older can kind of remember that and kind of, you know, understand that it's very difficult to convey gravitas, or especially back in the 90s. It was very difficult to convey gravitas and sophistication to an audience when you're dealing with what the popular conceptions were of the Middle Ages, of illiterate, unwashed people. Um, there was a lot wrong with the costuming in that film, but at the same time, there was a lot that was really right with the costumes. There was a lot that was, um, you have a lot of costumes on screen. This was one of the earlier films that really poured its energy into the costume. So a lot of the larger sequences, a lot of the more panoramic sequences, the battles, some of the sweeping scenes of the Scottish uh, villages and uh, the marches. You know, it's not one or two people center frame. This was one of the earlier films that really had a lot of people in a very, very convincing costume. And that that's a, a visual trick that helps pull you into the movie. And there's a lot of, frankly, there's a lot of really good costume in there. It's not the most sophisticated. A lot of the stuff I really enjoy looking at with the depictions of the footmen, especially the English infantry, um, some of the livery displayed, you know, those things are there. And a lot of that, I mean, varying degrees of accuracy, but at the concept level, that really did happen. They really were wearing some of that stuff. A lot of the armor, some of the armor was ridiculous, but a lot of the armor in that film is 
pretty solid for its day. I don't really, I don't remember a lot of my SCA friends that did heavy combat complaining about the depictions of armor in that film. The chain, the helmet, the breastplates, you know, it's gorgeous. And when we talk about this stuff, when we tell people, yeah, that that's lousy. You know, this over here, though, this is actually really accurate. Um, we can have that conversation. And that becomes a bridge. And I want to do here, the next step I want to do is I want to bridge something. So, and I'm, I'm going to cite my information here uh, in a minute, though. I just have a really cool story for you. So, we all know, for those of us that have seen the film, we all know the main characters. William Wallace, the heroic figure, the leader of the Scottish uh, rebel uprising to free Scotland from the English, yada, yada, yada. And William Longshanks, the... Uh, or excuse me, uh, Edward Longshanks, the uh, king of England, the invading uh, monarch, you know, the antagonist of the film. Um, and of course, Longshanks' son, Edward II, who in the film is, is portrayed very dismissively, has an inept, uh, weak figure, um, and they also um, say pretty expressly in the film that it's homosexual, and they link that uh, uh, and they kind of hint at his effeminacy as part and parcel to how weak of a figure he was. Now, when you, when you look at that, there, there's some truth in each of those elements, but one of the things that I found really interesting later on in life when I actually studied the real-life Edward I and the real-life Edward II in the real life Edward the third this is where it gets interesting so the princess in the film I believe played by Sophia Moreau um, the end of the film she of course says she's pregnant she implies that it's not the prince's child uh, hinting that because she'd had an affair with William Wallace um, and she says she'll do everything in her power to make sure his son never takes the throne or something to that effect. Now, the movie cuts off there. It's the idea of Wallace's legacy and what he inspires undoing the tyranny of a, of a monarch. It's all complete bull, of course. Um, the real-life princess would have been a child, and I don't think she ever was within a 100 miles of William Wallace. But the real life history of that particular couple of the prince and princess, uh, it's, this is where it gets interesting. Now I want to start off with, I want to tell you about another piece of media that I'm going to encourage you to uh, look up. Um, I want you to look up the book, The Plantagenets, The Warrior Kings and Queens Who Made England. And the author's name is Dan Jones. Um, and I happened to pick that book up at the library. As a matter of fact, I picked it up on Libby, which is a free app. If you have a library card, I highly encourage you, if you have a local library membership library card, I highly encourage you to, to see if they do Libby. Download Libby. It's a free app. Uh, your tax dollars pay for it. And there was an audio book of this. I got to listen to this when I was commuting to work at the time. And it's a phenomenal Phenomenal book. It talks about all the Plantagenet crowns of England from the first all the way up until uh, um, right before you get into the, I think right at the beginning of the Tudor Stuart period. But one of the Plantagenets is Edward II, who it is widely accepted that he was homosexual, um, and it is widely accepted by historians that he was. <laughs> I remember my history professor in college saying that he was definitely one of the top contenders for worst monarchs in England. Now, there was never any attempt to uh, imply that he was weak or say that his, uh, or say that his uh, ill, his poor skill as a monarch was related to the fact he was gay. But um, he, oh, he was wildly unpopular with the nobles of England. Um, and his, uh, by all accounts, his wife, his marriage with his wife, the same, uh, 
character is portrayed in the film was a political marriage that had no love between them. Uh, and where the story gets really interesting is, and again, I'm going to get, I want to make sure I get this information right, so pardon me while I review my notes. Um, when Edward III's mother, um, she left England at one point, I, I think the, under the pretenses of a trip, and she wound up in modern parlance moving in with one of the exiled nobles of England who was out of favor with the king. Um, I think Mortimer, if memory serves me. Um, and then a number of months later, for a number of reasons, which were all stupid, and this is one of those times where I get to say, no, no, the king was an idiot. He, he was called to, play, to uh, pay tribute to the king of France for his properties in, on the continent, and he was busy with other things and decided to send his son, which means he just handed the heir to the English throne over to his wife, who hates him. So the wife and her, for lack of better terms, boyfriend, um, now that they have control of the heir to the English throne, mount a private military campaign and invade England. I'm not joking. Um, and the uh, I just have a real tough time not envisioning Sophia Moreau at the head of that army, the actress who played uh, the princess in the film, of course. Um, but no, another matter. Um, they invaded England. They marched on uh, the king's location. His army deserted him almost immediately. There, to my knowledge, there was no battle. Uh, and they captured the king. Now, there are rumors about how he died and the actual manner of death is uh, disputed but there definitely is a persistent narrative that uh, his wife they never got divorced so she was still his wife may or may not have had a couple of strong men pin this guy down and feed a white hot poker up his backside to kill him um, really gotta wonder uh, uh, some of the backstory on that level of acrimony. Um, but that's that's not the best part. So not much longer later, uh, Edward II, who's a child, or Edward III, rather, excuse me, who's a child, is named King of England. However, um, the mother is named Crown Regent, which makes her boyfriend, who again, I think was Mortimer, I might be getting the name wrong, um, the de facto ruler of England. So fast forward a couple of years. Um, Edward III marries, and uh, I think just a few years later, he and his wife have a child together. And then, now this is the important date. Um, on the 19th of October, 13, yes, 1330. So Edward II, or Edward III rather, is 18 years old. He's literally living as a live-in prisoner under his mother's boyfriend. And he's supposed to be ruling England at this point because he's the rightful heir. So, like I said, on, uh, on October 19th, he and a number of friends sneak out of their respective homes, and they lived in, in opulent, by any measure of the day, opulent uh, accommodations, but they were closely watched by, uh, by uh, agents. Of, well, the mother was complicit. I know the mother's uh, friends were part of the people keeping an eye on them. But they literally snuck out of their homes in full kit and full armor, 18 or not, he was an accomplished sword fighter, writer, and general martial artist at this point. All of his friends were. It was part of noble upbringing, and royal upbringing was um, any man can be violent, but the elite were expected to be better at it. And he led a, he led a military coup d'etat, uh, surprising uh, his mother and uh, Mortimer. And... Um, taking, I mean, literally, I think it was a party of six guys, and they retook 
the crown of England in one night. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the Plantagenets, if you read the book, there's even a mention in there of he was late to the meeting because his wife decided that she wanted to send him out, send him out the door with a good luck token, which may or may not have involved several layers of clothing being removed. You know, if you're 18 and you're going to do something this insane, I, you might as well check all the boxes before you go out the door. Um, but, and that's, that was the beginning of what was really a remarkable reign. Now, granted, nothing is ever going to measure up, in my opinion, to Edward I, the warring king of England, the creator of the English parliament, um, the man who did expand the English uh, holdings dramatically, you know. Edward was a phenomenal crown. I've read a lot about him. I have several books on my bookshelf about him. And he, he was uh, he was brutal. He was uh, vicious. He was a, a, a capable, he's a very capable military commander. I'm not saying he's good, but in terms of what he accomplished, Edward I was a major figure in English history. But that doesn't diminish how absolutely amazing the story of Edward III is. And most people, when we talk to them, they're never going to hear, who the hell is Edward III? They don't even know who Edward II is. But if we watch Braveheart, we can point and we can say, okay, this movie is fiction, but here's a cool story about this character. Here's a cool story about that character. The baby she's supposedly carrying, man, will have a story to tell you about that kid. That's the power of even a bad historical film, is it opens the door for us to sit down and have fun history conversations. And let's just be absolutely frank about this. I've had plenty of people, plenty of long-time players in the SCA, established history buff players who've said, that when Braveheart came out, at the time, it was one of the best recruiting tools they had. And let's not forget, within the age of streaming media and, and um, you know, smartphones and all that, we, we need to keep in mind that even the bad history films, we've got to be ready to have these conversations because part of our job here, we've got to grow the SCA, we've got to bring in new people. We got to recover from this dip that was COVID and the lockdown. And uh, as people consume more movies, good and bad, and people talk about history, good and bad, instead of saying, oh, that was a terrible film. Okay, the history on the film sucked. I, I'll be the first to say it. The history on Braveheart sucked. I don't even think they were claiming it was good history. But that film is a phenomenal talking point for us to begin some real-life, fun, amazing, even epic historical conversations. So, what films do you like? What, what films do you like? Even if they're horrible history, what medieval theme films have you seen that you feel like would be a good talking point? I just watched, uh, just the other night, I watched Dracula Untold. I actually like the film a lot. I know it got lukewarm reviews. Um, 12 different versions of Robin Hood. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of films out there. What are we, uh, what are some new conversations we can have, even about the old stuff, even about the bad stuff? Until then, I'll see you at the next event or at the next movie. Goodbye, and God bless.